Uh, hi guys, it is uh, Dr. Misclough, a concerned doctor. It is uh, April 3rd, 2020, about 10 p.m. And I'm vlogging, after a few nights off of vlogging from my kitchen here in Toms River, New Jersey, about COVID-19. And the fact of the night is the first reported case of COVID-19 was December 8th, 2019 in uh, a Hunan fish market out of Wuhan, China. Actually, when they went back and looked at the first case, uh, it was found that there was no link to that fish market, but 27 of the 41 cases uh, in the first cohort or case reports listed uh, did have a connection to that Hunan fish market. So again, the fact of the night, December 8th, 2019 was the first reported case with no link to the fish market, but others were. So tonight I wanted to update everybody on clinicaltrials.gov. Uh, as of this morning, there were 128 clinical trials that were listed, actively recruiting, which is up from the 88 uh, that, were, that I reported on previously. Uh, one that's new was out of Iran, and it's on deferoxamine or desferal. This is an iron chelator that you're given for uh, three to five days through an intravenous for mild to moderate COVID pneumonia. So that was new. There's been talk about coagulation and risk for clots. Uh, this is, a, again, an iron chelator or binding iron out of the body. And again, you'll be on it for three to five days for mild to moderate pneumonia. So that was something new I hadn't seen on the previous. Uh, out of China, a nebulizer called D like David, A, S like Sam, 181, given as a nebulizer, 4.5 milligrams twice a day. This has been looked at for parainfluenza before by Anson Biotech or Biofarm. This is a recombinant sialidase protein. So it, it, it will break down or, or break apart a protein that's, I guess, involved in inflammation. Remember that there's a cytokine storm involved in, in COVID-19 and when the patients go into ARDS. And uh, speaking of that, out of Amsterdam, there is a IFX-1. This is a monoclonal antibody. We've heard the monoclonal antibody story before with interleukin-6, uh, noting that there are multiple interleukins and different proteins involved in the storm that leads to the inflammation in ARDS. This one's binding to complement, or C5A, and it has been utilized in or studied in heratinitis, suppurative, a skin disorder. So this is for severe COVID pneumonia, uh, the sicker patients, and again, out of Amsterdam, IFX1 as a monoclonal antibody uh, to C5A or complement. We've heard about uh, transition, uh, traditional Chinese medicine, uh, natural killer cells to the ACE2 receptor. Uh, speaking of the ACE uh, receptor, uh, there was even a trial listed where they're, they're, you know, they're databasing all these patients and looking at their medicines and uh, going to go back and see perhaps uh, these patients may have actually benefited from ACE inhibitors. And there's now talk about how, how potentially not just upregulating, but this may not be a bad thing and there may be more uh, uh, to this story. So stay tuned. For now, uh, the recommendation is pretty much to sit still. I understand why you wouldn't want to start an ACE off the bat without it being studied. Uh, however, uh, probably staying on your blood pressure medicines is the right thing for now until we have more data. Uh, but we've heard the tozolizumab story several times, anti-interleukin-6 out of Italy. That's being studied in, of course, the U.S. and other places as well. Uh, these are for patients who are either on respirators or not, but their pulse oximetry had to be 93% or less on room air uh, or on mechanical ventilation. Uh, the anti-IL-6, again, interleukin-6 being uh, one of the main players thought in, in COVID-19 in the cytokine storm and having a monoclonal antibody that can take out or block a receptor uh, for IL-6 will uh, could be potentially helpful. And at least anecdotally, we've seen some success with it. Uh, so again, we talked about complement 5. Tozolizumab is in several studies, both uh, for uh, intubated patients and not. Cirilumab, uh, even our hospital has a clinical trial with that. And we are recommending patients who uh, are uh, getting pulse oxes out about 92% about uh, or patients who are on high flow oxygen. Uh, technically, there is no oxygen requirement, uh, but this is a study of uh, uh, another IL-6 or anti-IL-6 uh, medication. So again, taking out IL-6, thought to be involved in the cytokine storm. And these patients do not need to be in intensive care units. They can be enrolled uh, to get this medication, just like uh, tozolizumab. Uh, Sidenafil or Viagra, we spoke of last time. Uh, additionally, there is a recombinant uh, GMCSF, 
or granulocyte macrophage uh, colony stimulating factor, which is a cytokine in its own right. That study is out of Belgium. Leukine is the brand name. Uh, Sangramostim or Sangramostim is the uh, name of the product. So it'll be interesting to see what happens when you use a recombinant uh, granulocyte macrophage colony stimulating factor and what that cytokine does. Remember, not all cytokines are necessarily bad uh, in the inflammation and may have a downregulatory effect. Uh, the HIV story we've heard of, protease inhibitors are being looked at uh, continuously, whether it be lapinavir lipinav uh, and retinavir combinations out of China uh, and other places throughout the world, uh, duranavir, uh, cobisostat, and hydroxychloroquine. Uh, we talked of uh, that study before out of Spain, and they were actually giving contacts of patients exposed to hydroxychloroquine. So probably a good uh, time to break out and just talk about that for a second. I'm getting a lot of questions from the community, from primary care physicians about whether or not they should be giving for milder patients, uh, outpatient, hydroxychloroquine or Plaquenil, uh, if they have symptoms or if they test positive, let's say, for COVID-19. And we're, not, we're reserving hydroxychloroquine for the inpatients who are actually sicker. And these patients also, pulse oximetry around 92%, uh, kind of how we're looking at patients for the Cirilumab trial. Uh, but using Plaquenil for that more moderate or severe case is really what the recommendation is. There's a shortage of the stuff. Uh, there are patients that require this for their baseline rheumatoid conditions. So my recommendation, at least, I, I can only speak for myself, but there are others supporting this, is not to use hydroxychloroquine or Plaquenil for milder disease or just for patients who think they have COVID-19. We should reserve that for clinical trials and also for patients who are chronically on it. Uh, there is no guarantee that this works. It is being studied extensively. Here's a trial that's looking at contacts. So, and, and there's other trials like that around the world. So let's wait and see what the data shows and save those medications for others. Uh, but again, lapinavir and retinavir also uh, being looked at in Korea for milder disease versus hydroxychloroquine. So, you know, again, not to use it right now for mild disease or not, not to use it for prophylaxis until it's studied. It is being looked at in these different countries for both prophylaxis in contacts, provi healthcare providers, and in milder disease. Uh, that particular study with lapinavir and retinavir uh, versus hydroxychloroquine or Plaquenil is using something called NEWS or the National Early Warning Score, a scoring system where they look at respiratory rate, pulse oximetry, some other variables like temperature, blood pressure, heart rate, uh, how much oxygen they're getting, etc., uh, to see what their risk factors is in a point system uh, for uh, uh, whether or not they're going to progress to respiratory failure, full-blown ARDS, uh, risk of uh, sepsis, these types of things. So uh, patients with relatively low scores or zero to four mild disease is how they were recruiting for that. Uh, remdesivir, we've uh, heard that uh, before and we, we have utilized it in a couple patients. Then it was limited in supply and, and, and not able to get it uh, for all the clinical sites. Uh, but there are studies undergoing for moderate to severe COVID-19. These are not only intubated patients, but uh, patients who are in you know, respiratory distress and hypoxic uh, but not necessarily um, on a respirator. And also looking, look, being looked at in China for mild to moderate disease, uh, patients could have pulse oximetries, I believe, over 94% in that study. Uh, out of China, an anti-VEGF or VEGF, we mentioned another monoclonal antibody recombinant, uh, Bevacizumab uh, is the uh, generic on that. Stem cells, uh, Fingolimod, uh, the MS, uh, multiple sclerosis product, is also being looked at. Uh, steroids, we're still advising people stay away from NSAIDs and non-steroidals, uh, pretty much trying to avoid ster uh, steroids if possible, but there are protocols that in, around the country and world that will include them, uh, especially if the patient is on the respirator uh, or progressing into respiratory failure, there is a consideration. Uh, we do believe that the ibuprofens may have a, a, a negative effect, but it still has to be looked at in registries and will eventually be looked at retrospect retrospectively as well. But methylprenicolone out of Beijing is uh, being studied in 400 patients as an IV for seven days, one milligram per kilogram per day. Okay, so 100 kilogram uh, patient would get 100 milligrams in that day. BCG vaccines, and there's several vaccine trials with BCG vaccines uh, to try and reduce healthcare providers' uh, risk uh, is being looked at. Um, one to break away and talk about again about the hydroxychloroquine. 
uh, is out of Turkey. Uh, there was a study with healthcare providers and those primary relatives, so spouses, brothers, sisters, children, etc. And they are looking at prophylaxis in those patients at hydroxychloroquine, uh, 200 milligrams. I believe it was yeah every three weeks. So they're just taking a pill every three weeks. But they were also taking zinc, vitamin C, and I believe uh, some of them will get uh, A and D as well in that cocktail. So the supplement story, again, uh, Chinese and Italy are studying vitamin C and intravenous high dose. And out of, uh, this wasn't listed on clinical.gov, uh, but clinicaltrials.gov, but out of Northwell System, the Post, New York Post had uh, listed uh, the Northwell System was, was also studying high dose or higher dose vitamin C, but I believe that was uh, much less than the Chinese and Italians. So I think it was around 1.5. Q6 or Q8 IV, but in China, they're looking at 12 grams or 12,000 milligrams IV Q12, and in Italy, 10 grams IV Q24 Q daily. Uh, but this is uh, one of the few that's listed that actually has zinc, vitamin C, and also A and D listed, but the, uh, and also for prophylaxis of the providers, their, uh, their primary relatives is mentioned, so that's kind of a cool study. Again, the Italians looking at vitamin C, uh, also, observational studies I mentioned about ACE inhibitors and ARBs and whether or not they may actually be beneficial or harmful. That story is still not complete. Uh, the Japanese anti-influenza product, uh, Favipiravir, uh, is also being studied with uh, tozolizumab out of Peking, so an anti-flu product, and, and they're, they're claiming high, uh, highly successful uh, anecdote, at least, on those patients. Uh, we, uh, we don't see a study like that, I believe, in the United States yet, um, but F-A-V-I-P-I-R-A-V-I-R, -A -A uh, so that medicine is uh, kind of like the equivalent of, of Tamiflu or um, so Amstalmavir, uh, although slightly different in how it works. It's, it's very similar, and that's being looked at with the IL-6 blocker, tozolizumab. Okay, what else do we have? Uh, Germany is looking at ECMO, uh, so the extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, basically hooking these patients to a bi uh, bypass machine, and they'll stay on this for uh, quite a while, many weeks potentially. Uh, but a, a, a company out of Monmouth Junction, New Jersey, so uh, our home state here, Cytosorbents, is using a ECMO plus a cytokine absorption. I don't know exactly how it works, if it's a filter system or not. Couldn't get too much information on it. But with ECMO, uh, the mortality rate, at least in the previous studies, was as high as 83 to 100 percent in those groups. So those were almost salvage cases. But here they're using ECMO with this, you know, again, New Jersey-made device uh, hooked to the ECMO, uh, which somehow absorbs the cytokines and their measuring level levels. And I thought that was kind of cool. Uh, also, tozolizumab versus CRRT, or a form of dialysis. Uh, continuous uh, renal re replacement therapy looked at in chi being looked at in China, and I believe the uh, Health Commission there has updated uh, their guidelines, um, uh, and they think that the CRRT may help control severe COVID-19. Uh, I'm no nephrologist, so I'm not going to get into how that may work, but uh, actually comparing an IL-6 uh, anti-IL-6 tozolizumab to that type of uh, dialysis and doing this continuous type of dialysis. Uh, I think the French have got a good one. They're actually doing a multi-prong uh, arm study looking at remdesivir. So we, uh, we've, we've heard that story before. Uh, plus standard of care uh, will be one arm. Standard of care with none of these medicines will be another arm. Uh, the HIV medicine, lapinavir and retinavir, uh, also with standard of care. And they're also looking at interferon beta-1, again with standard of care, and then a plaquenil or hydroxychloroquine arm. So the French are, are looking at that in patients coming in, and they, they're not on ventilators. These are milder uh, all the way up, I suspect, in, in severity. So we're getting there almost to the end. Uh, Paris has 1,000 uh, that they're studying, healthcare providers, emergency room personnel, intensive care, and people out of infectious disease departments. Uh, we think that probably the ER, ICU would have uh, very hard-hit areas um, uh, so uh, that there's a study being looked at there. Uh, I believe that was also an antibody to IgG. Uh, nitric oxide studies we've spoken of. There's also a JAK1, JAK2 uh, inhibitor, uh, which is thought to inhibit cytokine release. 
and they're looking at that called baricitinib uh, plus ritinavir, the HIV medicine. So this JAK1, JAK2 mechanism has been looked at. I'm not so sure, I have to ask my heme uh, oncology colleagues, but maybe for lymphomas or leukemias, it may have some role as well. Uh, but uh, um, I'd have to look that up. But JAK1, JAK2 mechanism out of the heme onc world. Uh, Brazil, uh, uh, for my uh, uh, great college buddy, Alex Almeida, I know you're out there in either Belo Horizonte or uh, Brasilia, I believe. Uh, they're studying hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin. Uh, not doc, not uh, Almeida himself, that's just a friend of mine I'm, I'm giving a, a shout out to, but hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin is being looked at in Brazil. Again, we're not recommending uh, giving these just blanketed to outpatients that have symptoms or even test positive. If they're mild and they're able to stay home, uh, then they are uh, probably not needing these medications, and I'm just recommending supplements at this point. If they make it into the hospital, uh, we're taking it on a case-by-case -case basis at this point, but uh, we do have protocols, and those protocols are ready to be, you know, they're always moving and changing. Uh, however, uh, hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin would be reserved, uh, and especially as a PO now with the azithro, if we're going to use it at all, we're trying to give it as PO because we're limited on the IV. It's running out, so the more moderate to severe may be a Z-pack. And out of Shanghai, the, the convalescent plasma story, I did a vlog on that recently about convalescent plasma and what that means. Uh, so Shanghai is looking at that and other places are ramping up, uh, but at least registered, I saw it. Uh, I believe Mount Sinai, that uh, I didn't see it registered, but it, it could be on there. I, I didn't see it, but they're also studying this. And many other centers are ramping up. Uh, the Israelis uh, are uh, going to be studying that as well. Sanofi Pharmaceuticals is looking at hydroxychloroquine for outpatients, uh, looking at viral loads in the na nasal swab, and then I, I believe about 72 hours later and seeing where it goes from there. Montreal is looking at colchicine versus placebo. And uh, that's pretty much it for the clinical trials uh, listed. It's a lot of information, uh, but I think it's important to stay up to date on everything that's being looked at around the world. So that's 128 studies in a few minutes. Uh, actually, that one took almost 20 minutes. I wanted to mention another one called an anti, another monoclonal antibody to interleukin-1, uh, Anakinra, uh, A-N-A-K-I-N-R-A, -A -A -A, or Kinerot. Uh, this is out of a Swedish company called, so I believe, Sobi's Pharma uh, Pharmaceuticals, S-O-B-I. And um, uh, they're also looking at that with an, uh, a monoclonal antibody that neutralizes interferon, uh, imapalumab. Uh, so this has uh, also been used in another condition. Uh, so, you know, just other things to keep our eyes on. We'll, we'll keep updating the clinical gov uh, trials uh, and, and to keep uh, watching for newer innovations and, and what else is being studied around the world. But an uh, anti-IL-1 may be the next thing that gets listed on there. Uh, and that is going to be for uh, hyperinflammatory syndromes. And, of course, COVID-19 is a hyperinflammatory syndrome. So everybody stay well. Uh, please uh, stay protected, and we'll see you again. Thank you.